coming to you on Secular Media Network. This is the Gatheist Manifesto, your source for news, commentary, discussion, and debate at the intersection of the atheist movement and the LGBT rights movement. I'm your host, Callie Wright, and I am joined today by my co-host, Daniel Wolfsong. Hey there, everyone. And Jonathan has the week off. We have a few things to discuss today. So this week, the world was introduced to Caitlyn Jenner. I've had quite a few people ask me what my thoughts are on this, so I'll lay them out here. First, I want to say on a personal level that I'm really, really, really happy for her. Coming out and beginning my transition was one of the most liberating experiences of my life, despite how scary it was and how uncertain I was. And it's always awesome to see someone embrace their true self and live their lives as the person they truly are inside. I have a few worries and a few problems, though. I try really hard not to be the killjoy social justice warrior that's never happy with anything and finds everything problematic, but on this one I sort of can't help it. First, so many of the comments that I've seen center around her physical appearance and the dramatic change that we've seen and how gorgeous she is and how everyone is surprised that she doesn't look like a man anymore. And I've talked before about how physical transition is important for many trans people. Not all trans people, but many. So I don't want to necessarily discount that as something that's being important or as something that's important. My problem here is that so many of the comments talk about that to the exclusion of everything else. Outside of the circle of allies I know who really get it, I see so little conversation about the significance of someone coming out and beginning to live their lives as the person they are. I worry about what this is going to do to the general perception of trans people in the public eye, because while Caitlin is trans, she's also fabulously wealthy, white, and privileged. I worry that people won't get the message that for most of us in the trans community, transition is costly, grueling, and can take years and even decades. And I don't begrudge someone who has access to those resources taking advantage of them. And uh, I, I know if I had that kind of money in the bank, I'd use it immediately for everything that I need. So this isn't to pin all of this on Caitlin. Caitlin didn't come out and become responsible for the trans community. She didn't ask to come out and transition in this tabloid crazy celebrity obsessed culture that we live in. So I'm not necessarily blaming her for the problems that I see, just that I worry about what this will mean for the way trans people are generally viewed by our society. This could be a major win, but it could also be majorly hurtful. I'm never one to tell someone that they should be an activist simply because of who they are. I'm never one to tell anyone what their life should be about. All I can say is that I sincerely hope that Caitlin will use her privilege and her platform to help less privileged trans folks who still face the unemployment, underemployment, homelessness, violence, lack of access to health care, etc. Though uh, with news of a reality show in the making, I'm not exactly optimistic. Yeah, I too am very happy for Caitlin. And I think especially after these last few years, the, the tabloids, the media have really been scrutinizing her during her uh, transition process. And um, I, that, I can't imagine what that's like, but I imagine that it's got to be pretty stressful when you constantly have photographers and media uh, reporting every step of your transition and even before you're ready to tell the world. So I think that the, the Vanity Fair uh, photo cover and... Uh, coming out was probably really felt really good and um, and I'm happy for her for that and I celebrate that moment with her um, I too also see the other side of this and um, privilege isn't necessarily a bad thing we know that you know someone being you know wealthy white um, these are things that are not necessarily bad in and of themselves but, um, well, right. They, and so many people yeah. are born into these things. I mean, it's not like we're saying like, well, you're rich, so you're a bad person. You know what I right. mean? It's not necessarily a circumstance you have control over. Right. Exactly. And it's just fine. I, I just find myself, I found myself saying when I read this story, I hope that she continues to use that platform <laughs> and that privilege to, to continue raising awareness for the trans community and to advance the trans movement. Because I mean, it's, you know, trans people and gay people, especially, um, today we you sort of have an obligation to at least be a, a a positive part of the of the movement whether it's the gay you know the for gay rights or for trans rights and cultural acceptance um i like you i can't tell anyone how to be an activist i just feel like you know look around you we we need you to be to be that so i'm hoping that she'll use her wealth and her fame uh to to make a difference in the trans community um 
That said, something that I've seen for a while that I've been thinking about, and I don't know exactly how to feel about this because I'm not a trans person, so I so I rely on your opinions and and the opinions of other trans people. But I'm finding that the the mainstream narrative when it comes to trans visibility seems to focus pretty much exclusively on cis normative beauty standards. How hot are they? Oh God, how, yeah. How, this this trans man, how hot is he as a man? Um, this trans woman, how gorgeous is she? How passable? Like, do they do they look like? Uh, a cis man or a cis woman, you know, could you, would you be able to tell that they were trans if you saw them walking on the street? And see, there, it, it seems that the, or even the progressive media, they either focus on that. The only other time when you hear about trans people, if it's not that narrative, is when it comes to a victim of suicide. Right, exactly. So I'm starting to wonder, is this sort of the visibility that we have currently for, for trans people? And trans people are definitely becoming more visible, and that's a good thing. But I'm wondering how do people, how do trans people who, who don't fit these standards of cis normative beauty, who either because they don't want to or just because they can't, um, how are they feeling about what's essentially uh, representative of the trans movement, at least you know in the eyes of the media? Yeah, I, that, that's something that I struggle with a lot because. I'm a person who's a girly girl. Like I'm a femme girl. Like I like uh-huh. makeup and I like painting my nails and I like being pretty and I like, you know, looking put together and, um, and, and those are things that I like for myself. Right. But I'm also never one to judge someone's character if that's not what they're about. If, you know, they're not necessarily so concerned about how they look or how they present. Like all of that's okay. And, and, and I think that's where the disconnect happens mm-hmm. because, I think what what seems to be praiseworthy in the eyes of society is that she's fitting those cis normative standards of beauty. Right. And you know, I mean I can't tell you how many Facebook comments I've seen like, wow, she doesn't even look like a man. It doesn't look like she used to be a man and mm-hmm. um and like from people who are otherwise allies and mm-hmm. <clears throat> it, it's hard to know how to navigate that because you know, so many of those comments come from people who mean well. And I don't, I mean, I don't want to just attack somebody, but you know, there, there is a problem with thinking that way, you know, because, because one, like you said, not all of us want to fit those standards and that's okay. People shouldn't be judged or ostracized for not wanting to fit those standards. And the other side of it is there are some people who desperately want to and can't either because of, you know, the way that their genetics built their body, the fact that they don't have money for access to surgeries or hormones or any sort of health care or even clothes and makeup. Right. Um, you know, I, I don't, I just, I hate the idea that we are so obsessed with the way that trans people look instead of the way trans people live. Yes, that's that's my worry too, and um, and I worry that the, the trans people you're just describing—they're not seeing anyone to represent them in our in our mainstream media, and um, and that's a problem. And when I think about uh, when I think about the the progression of the gay the gay rights movement, and when I say the progression of the gay rights movement, I'm also talking I'm mainly talking here about uh, our progression of acceptance and culture, not you know not even going into the legal aspects of that. Um, there was never this that I can, that I can see. I've had some people disagree with me on this, but I can't see that there was this much emphasis on physical beauty when it came to accepting gay people, um, into society. And this seems to be something that's unique to the trans movement. And I'm, I mean, I'm guessing it's because if, if a trans person comes out, if a little trans girl comes out, and says, "I am. I am a trans woman. This is who I. This is who I really am." And comes out and shows herself to the world. The almost, it's almost a knee jerk reaction that people will have to that. And that's first of all, how beautiful is she? How how passable does she look? Right. And if she does, and if she do, if she is beautiful and and looks like you would expect a cisgender woman to look, then she's highly celebrated. Um, if she doesn't conform to those things, then there there seems to be less of a. It almost seems less celebratory to me. Right. 
And that's, um, I mean, that, that fits into a broader discussion about right. ex- expectations surrounding gender roles. And, um, <laughs> there will be an episode on feminism. <laughs> um, Good. but, uh, you know, I, I think that's, well, and that, that fits into the discussion that we'll have in the next segment about, you know, being treated equally by a society who, uh, treats women unjustly. Um, you know, if that's really a thing to celebrate. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I just, I struggle so much because I'm the kind of person, like, having the platform that Caitlyn Jenner now has and the opportunity to affect the lives and attitudes, uh, the lives of trans people and the attitudes of society surrounding trans people, it is impossible for me to see how someone wouldn't be motivated to yeah. use that platform to make a difference and to do good things. At I the agree. same time, why why should she be held to any different standard than some people I know in my community who, once they're as transitioned as they want to be, they want to just fold back into normal life and they just want to live their lives. They don't want to be activists and they don't want to go to protests and lobby their government and all that sort of stuff. And you know what? I understand that. Right. You know, there are some people who just want to live regular sort of normal lives as as just you know regular human beings and god i understand that i mean i understand that impulse and i would never shame somebody for saying you know like i just i I don't want to be an activist i don't want to be out there in the public eye and Mm -hmm. i don't think it's necessarily fair to hold her to a different standard just because she's rich um, well, also because there's also the fame aspect of that too. Right, exactly. And so I'm, I'm hesitant to say that I feel like she's obligated to do it, but man, I hope she does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I am. I'm, I can't, you know, none of us can tell someone to be an activist, no matter who they are, no matter how rich and famous and, and, uh, in the, in the public eye, we can't, we don't get to tell them that, but, um, it's just one of those things where you kind of think that you have this platform, you have this voice. Why not just go for it? But, you know, it's it's her choice. I we, we hope she chooses one way, but ultimately it is her choice. Right. And, I mean, I heard something about a reality show in the works surrounding her. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm really interested to see what that looks like. Um you know, reality shows generally are not uh, not so great at, showing people's lives as they really are. And, you know, it's all about sensationalism and, um, you know, drama and all that sort of stuff. And I just, my, my fear is that we live in a society who looks up to celebrities Mm -hmm. and what they're going to see is I did an interview with Diane Sawyer a month and a half later. I'm done. And that's the idea that people are going to get about trans people. I hope not. I want to think better of the society that we, that we live in than to believe that that's what people will think. But history has kind of shown otherwise. Um, I just, I don't look forward to being lectured by someone. Well, Bruce Jenner came out in transition. Why is it such a big deal for you? You know what I mean? And I like, God, I feel like, I feel like that's, I feel like that's going to happen. Yeah, and that's you know, it's 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 pretty foolish to look at the end result, this Vanity Fair cover, and then say, "See how easy that was?" Right. <laughs> because I mean, let's look back at the last few years when um, when Caitlyn, before she came out as Caitlyn, while she was still known as Bruce and was still using uh, male pronouns, she was hounded almost. Co- I was seeing I was seeing her on the the covers of tabloids for years, you know, in the grocery store. <laughs> Um, and it was clear that she wasn't ready to come out and it was, it was clear that this was a journey and it had to be a very difficult one. Right. And if, if you can see that happening, you know, with a, someone who's rich and famous and, um, you know, a celebrity, it shouldn't be that hard for, you know, for, for, you know, your regular person, uh, to, to say, you know, this is probably pretty difficult for a trans person who isn't rich and who isn't famous, who is dealing with more than just the, I mean, because of course, you know, I'm not going to say Caitlin only dealt with the, with only had to deal with the, the aftermath of, 
the public response, of course, she you know she had she has a family as well, and friends who also who probably knew this, but but she also answered to them. But I think it's really it's important not to conflate dealing a rich. Uh, I hate I keep, I keep saying rich and famous person. Really, I should just be saying celebrity because I don't I don't want to like you know demonize that uh, too much. But I think it's important for for people to see that a celebrity facing the public with her coming out that shouldn't be conflated with an individual facing their friends and their family and life as a normal human being who doesn't have, who isn't famous, who, you know, who has to deal with that um, just as a regular person. Those, those two are not the same. Right. And, and I fear that so many people think they are. Yeah. And um, well, that's, that's why we're here. Right. Exactly. (laughs) And, and that's, you know, and, and that's why, like I said, I want to be careful. I'm not trying to pin, you know, the position of the trans community on Caitlyn Jenner. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to say that she now has a personal responsibility because she didn't ask to be trans in the society. She didn't ask to, you know, to live in a celebrity obsessed culture where everybody's going to look at her as if she's the default, whatever type of person she is. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, I mean, that's not her fault, but there are still consequences of that that everyday trans people are going to, are going to face and could be, you know, either positively or negatively affected by. And I mean, I think it's too early to make a call of like, oh, this is going to be awesome for the community or all oh, this is going to be bad for the community. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's probably, it's probably going to be a mixed bag. You know what I mean? Because I am 100% in favor of trans visibility. And I think visibility in itself is usually always partially a good thing, at least partially a good thing, because it means that we're being talked about. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, there are other things that come along with it that may cause more problems than it solves, if that makes sense. It makes sense, because what what also matters is the cultural narrative that's happening around the visibility. Right. Um, and if if the narrative continues to be full of stigma and taboo, then, you know, if, the, if, if Caitlin's story is continually reported on and told by mainstream media as... As you know, another man thinks he's a woman. Well, I guess I guess society is just going crazy. Um, that's going to be people are going to latch onto that narrative. And I've heard, I've already heard Fox News, uh, Fox News treating uh, Caitlyn's coming out in, in a way similar to that. Um, well, there's a shock. <laughs> yeah, there's a that's a big shock. But the, but people you know people see this and they think, oh yeah, that's weird because trans people will make me feel kind of icky, and I and so. So this in and of itself is the, the visibility can be a good thing or a bad thing. It really depends on how it's treated uh, by, the, by the media and through uh, public, public consciousness. And that's one thing that, I, that I, would, I would really love to see progressive media taking a wider expanse when it comes to, when it comes to trans visibility. Um, they have the opportunity to go beyond just look how beautiful Laverne Cox is. Look how beautiful Caitlyn Jenner looks. Uh, look at all these look at all these really hot, passable trans people. They look they 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 look really cis normative. That makes everyone feel really good about them. I'd like to see them go beyond that and tell tell the stories of of other tra- of other trans people who don't fit those descriptions. Um, because that's how that's how we, that's how people who would otherwise who otherwise probably would never know anything about a trans person that's how they can learn a little bit more about trans people and that opens up uh, bridges of communication to uh, between cis people and trans people. So. Yeah, I think that's I think that's probably a perfect place to 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 kind of put a pause on this one. Um, obviously, there's going to be a lot more to this, and we will. Um, you know, we'll obviously bring, bring that to you. Um, you know, (laughs) people always ask me when things like this happens, if I have anything to say and I'm like, do you know me? Is there any, (laughs) is there ever a time where I don't have something to say? (laughs) So as, uh, you know, as things develop, obviously we will bring more, uh, we will bring more of that to you. We'll be back with more of the Gatheus Manifesto right after this. Visit SecularMediaGroup.com to see how we're changing the world. Here's an excerpt from Atheist Universe by David Mills. There was never any doubt voiced or even contemplated that day didn't mean day in the book of Genesis. 
Even Henry Morris and other creation science champions reaffirmed completely their belief that Genesis was literally true. Not so for the ID followers. They reject Genesis as being literally true, but can't seem to bring themselves to say that Genesis is literally false. They are torn schizophrenically between their emotional dependence on the local religion and their embarrassment at having to accept the serpent in the garden along with their savior on the cross. The ID cultists want to be counted among the religious faithful, but long to be perceived as science-minded as well. ID evangelists are embarrassed by the content of their own Bible. Despite innumerable biblical references to the devil, ID's preachers never use the term publicly because they are ashamed of it. Atheist Universe by David Mills is available at atheistaudiobooks.com. Welcome back to the Gatheist Manifesto. Uh, so today's second, I would like to uh, sort of piggyback on the subject of Caitlin's coming out and, uh, and sort of talk about this idea of equality versus justice. Equality means everyone is treated equally, but if people generally are treated, um, but if people are generally treated unjustly by society, is equality enough? For example, Recently, a transgender teen named Jazz Jennings was selected to be a model for Clean and Clear's See the Real Me campaign. My initial reaction was to be happy because, as we talked about before, trans visibility is a good thing. But then I thought to myself, the beauty industry makes billions off of the exploitation of women and pushing these unrealistic beauty standards on women and girls. So is a trans girl being exploited the same way actually something to celebrate? Now, to be clear, I don't know really anything about the specifics of this particular campaign that she's a part of. So my comment isn't about this specifically, but more the general situation. Jazz is getting a reality show, as uh, as I said before, uh, in addition to I think Caitlin is too. And again, trans visibility is a good thing. But as before, I think we know how close to reality these reality shows typically are and how they exploit people's situations in the service of stirring up drama instead of painting a realistic portrait of the lives that trans people lead. So I want to have a discussion about that. Daniel, what do you think? I think I have a, I have a few thoughts on this, <laughs> and I'm not really sure um, how I feel about it. But uh, if we look at reality TV, the way it's progressed, it's – typically a circus, you know, it highlights, uh, sort of the insanity and the, the things that people like to point and laugh at of, of people's lives and, and makes a spectacle of it. And it's, it's almost, it's either, it seems to be either making a joke, you know, the, 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 like, um, the people who are part of, who are the stars of the reality show, either making a joke of them and exploiting them for the entertainment of the people watching, or it just kind of grossly overemphasizes um, how important these people should be to us. You know, like the uh, the Kardashians. Why do we care so much about what these people are doing on a daily basis? Well, you know? right, and that's <laughs> something that I was thinking about because because Caitlyn Jenner. I mean. I would say at least to an extent she earned her fame. I mean, she was an athlete, she was like an, athlete, an elite right. Olympic athlete. So like there is, there is a, there is a story there in so her a story life. There. Yeah. There's a story um, there. And I think that, but the Kardashians, <laughs> they're famous for being famous. <laughs> they're famous for being famous. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Is it, that's a weird thing that is that it's somehow a thing now, right? You're famous just because people know who you are and that's, that's weird. But, um, I think that if this is done the right way, this could be really good for trans visibility. If this, you know, if, if, um, and again, it doesn't even have to be a show made to be about activism. If, if Caitlin does have a show and, um, and if jazz, if jazz also gets his show, but if there's the opportunity there for this to say, Hey, trans people are like you and me. They, um, they, and break down those taboos and those, those, uh, those bits of mystery that keep people sort of scared of trans people. Um, or it could, it could make them the butt of a joke. 
I mean, you never know. It just it seems to depend on what the network has in mind for it. Right. And and I and I just you know I, I keep going back to this like not wanting to be a killjoy. <laughs> like you know there are trans people who are famous now. That's something to be excited about. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know where where people like Laverne Cox and Janet Mock are concerned. Mm-hmm. I am one hundred percent unequivocally excited about them being famous because they get it and um you know i don't know if oh yeah you said before the show that you read the piece that laverne cox wrote about caitlin jenner's coming out and how you know we should celebrate with her because coming out you know for those who choose to do it and for those who feel that they need to do it at the end of the day should be a happy thing Mm -hmm. and um you know i'm really glad that she's able to do that but we can't forget the less privileged people who who live this every day who don't have the money who don't have the privilege who don't have the platform and so so you know kind of bringing it back to the the you know, this this idea of equality versus justice mm-hmm. um so you know is is this something to celebrate but with caveats is this something to just sort of be critical of is it you know are are we being too too harsh in not just saying hey this is a victory like what do you think okay um when i think about this i think back to moments of like moments of gay rights victories for instance uh with gay marriage when when gay marriage began uh becoming legal in the first few states. And as we know, the law, the law is catching up. Uh, we gay marriages, it's been a domino effect across the nation and pretty soon we'll see it. Uh, it won't, it won't be something that we'll have to continue uh, going to court about. It'll be legal throughout the country. Um, that doesn't mean culture is caught up to it. So even though it's legal, we still have even government officials saying, well, I'm not going to, I'm st- I'm not going to marry gay people, even though it's my job legally. I'm not going to because I don't, I don't believe in gay marriage. So somehow they think their personal views get to dictate how they do their government job. That doesn't make sense to me, nor should it. And it takes culture a long time to catch up. When you look at uh, the progression of the civil rights movement for black people, we're still we're still living in in a country that is uh, that has extreme roots of racism and and bigotry towards black people, and the law has been on their side for decades, right? In many in many respects, right? So culture takes a long time to catch up, and I think that's I think we're going to see that with uh, with the trans movement as well, and when it comes to the issue of trans women sort of being treated equally as cisgender women. Honestly, and this is, I'm, I fully admit that I, I might be coming across a little, a little cynical here. I think that we're a long way from, just because a, just because a trans woman gets featured in a, in a beauty commercial, I think we're a long way from being able to say, see, trans women are being treated equally to cisgender women. Because, um, do, was, it, was it Dove? Was that the company? That clean and this? Clear. Clean and Clear, Okay. I know Dove has done a lot of these, a lot of these quote real beauty campaigns that look really, you know, when you're watching them, like, oh wow, that's really inspirational, and that's really. But then you, then it's like, this is a company. A company doesn't have a heart and soul. Let's, you know, they don't. Right. They can have a mission statement, and that's fine. Um, I wonder how much they really care about women versus how much they know they can make a lot of money off of telling these stories. Right. Um, so I'm I'm distrustful of corporations for good reason when it comes to that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I guess I need to look up the definition of cynical because is it cynicism if your you know attitude reflects reality? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I I mean I think so. <laughs> I, I think my attitude reflects reality, but I think everybody right. does, and that's where we run into problems. But, um, right. Right. But yeah, I think that you know yeah we definitely we still. <laughs> I think you 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 were saying once, and I think you were even saying it on the show that you uh, before your transition you experienced the benefits of male privilege, and then once right. you transitioned, you were suddenly thrust into the world of um, 
male privilege as seen from the perspective of a woman who right. doesn't benefit from that. Yep. <laughs> so I <laughs> exactly. think I think that this is this sort of goes along with that because we're seeing um, we're still we're still living in a culture where, where women are objectified. And and they're they're valued based on how how beautiful they are and how much sexual fulfillment they provide to men. Um, so a trans woman being put into that world, um, it's good on one side and really crappy on the other side because we're still talking about a a paradigm that isn't fair to women. Right, and and I I think that's kind of where I come down because, mm-hmm. I mean. Progress is is progress, right? Even if it's mm-hmm. small, as long as we're realistic and we're not saying that like, oh, this happened, so everything's all good now. Um, you know, this happens, so the trans movement has done its job and everything's all good. You know, I think as long as we're realistic about the the incremental nature of the change. And, you know, there are still trans people who can't even find a doctor who knows what transgender means. Yeah. Um, you know, as long as we recognize that those problems still exist, I think we can celebrate these, these victories, recognizing that, um, you know, the, the victory sometimes comes at a cost and yes. it has, it has little, little qualifications attached to it that, you know, like, let's have a party, but let's get back to work tomorrow. Yeah. And I think when you're, when you're like us and you're sort of on the bleeding edge of progressivism, you're going to see every victory with the little asterisks. <laughs> little <laughs> right. asterisks and one of the things that, I'm, that I've really been giving a lot of thought to lately, because um, in, the, in the progression of the gay rights movement, uh, the, the movement of gay people being uh, accepted and integrated into, into society as equals, um, something that has come up a lot is the, the issue of what's normal for us what, versus what's normal for a straight person. And this is what we know as heteronormativity. And a lot of gay people began asking, well, should I strive for these heteronormative ideals that um, straight people strive for it, it, that doesn't, doesn't necessarily fit gay culture, but we try to make it fit? I'm mm-hmm. seeing that with uh, the trans movement as well. And what, you know, what I guess we would just call uh, cisnormativity, mm-hmm. um, and we have called it that on the show already, and that should trans people necessarily strive to fit in a world made for cisgender people when it comes to things like beauty, the whole concept of passing, you know, a, a, a trans woman passing mm-hmm. for, for a woman, um, things like that. I mean, what do, you, what do you think when it comes to that? Should we, should we, be, should we, would we be rooting for a, a paradigm shift? And what's and what's normal for trans people versus cisgender people? Yeah. So my my thought really is that at the root of it, we should be rooting for people to be comfortable with themselves and for yes. people to for people to achieve their own goals, whatever those goals may be. And you know, for someone like me, like I said, you know, beauty is something that's important to me. I like I like wearing makeup. I like being pretty. I like being put together. I like wearing cute clothes. Um, you know, that my entire life isn't about that, (laughs) but, but those, (laughs) but those are things, those are things that matter to Mm me. And, you know, we can, we can unpack whether or not that's a result of me growing up in a culture where I was told that's what the default woman was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. And, you know, I, I'm not even so sure that that matters entirely because it's just it's me and it's what i want to be and when someone says you look beautiful i take it as a compliment because that's something that i'm going for yeah it's not because i feel good that i'm fitting in right um and and that may seem like a small distinction but to me it's a big one um, I, I was having a conversation, I mean, literally just before we recorded the show with a friend of mine and, and we were kind of talking about that because we're both the kind of girls that are really into beauty and really like, you know, I don't go out without makeup on and, and that kind of stuff. But, you know, having those standards for yourself is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. It's pushing those standards on other people and, you know, making knocks on other people's characters for not following those standards. That's when problems start. 
because some people, one, like you said, don't necessarily want to f- want to fit those standards. Right. And some people can't fit those standards and want to. Some people just don't care. And and that's all valid for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so for me, I mean, if, if we were to talk about justice, justice for me would be shifting society towards high-fiving people for achieving their goals and for realizing their vision of who they are and what they want for themselves and for their lives. And if those things happen to line up with societal expectations, whatever. If they don't, whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, those things becoming irrelevant is really the goal for me. It's not even necessarily fighting against those standards because, I mean, we can talk about, you know, fat shaming and skinny shaming Mm -hmm. if we're talking about justice versus equality, right? We don't have to, I'm a fat chick. I'm cool with that. Um, I mean, I'm not for some, some reason. It's not a knock on my character that I'm fat. It's just who I, it's just what I am. Right. And, um, I'm attracted to big girls and I'm attracted to big guys. That doesn't mean that I have to shame skinny girls and shame skinny guys as if they're less than because they're skinny. Um, just because I've been made fun of and shamed for being fat. Like those things are both equally wrong. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, like I said, justice for me is, is making those standards irrelevant and worrying about, Hey, what is it that you want from your life? Oh, you achieve that? Good for you. High five. Let's hug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I, I like that. That actually makes a lot of sense because I'm as you were as you were talking, I was thinking about the the moments in my own life as I was coming into myself and um, not not just as a gay man, but just as a person, just discovering, you know, figuring out who I was and who I, who I wanted to be and how I wanted to project myself to the world. And there were there were lots of things that. I thought I want to be this, but I only want to be this because society tells me this is a good thing to be, but it doesn't quite fit. And there were things about myself that I thought this, I want to be, I do want to be this, even though society isn't so crazy about this, but this does feel right. And there were also things that society says I should be this and I want to be this because it feels good. So I'm going to be this. So I think, I, I think it's really cool that you broke it down that way because that makes sense. And I think if we can get to a point where, you know, let's, let's just throw out normative altogether. And like you said, let's high five people for having, having the balls to be themselves. Um, if balls apply. And if not, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice, that was a nice save. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So, um, and just let people be themselves, you know, it's so funny how we can look at an internet video and we as a collective culture look at an internet video of a kid just stepping out of the norm and being amazing, this amazing nonconformist kid. And everyone's like, wow, how brave, how amazing. But then that, but it's like, then when they see that kid in real life on the street, they make fun of them and they belittle them because they're a weirdo and they're they're not doing things the right way. And, um, let's not do that anymore. Let's let people be themselves and, and express themselves the way, the way they want to, um, whether or not it goes along with the societal norm. I couldn't agree more. So we're going to take a quick break and we will be back with be a better ally on the Gatheist manifesto. Get sexy with Dr. Daryl Ray and secular sexuality only on secular media network. Hello, I'm Alan Cumming. Live Out Loud is calling on the LGBT community to help improve life for gay teens. Take what you know and gay it forward through the Homecoming Project, a chance to return to your old high school and share your story with LGBTQ youth. Your life experiences and wisdom can prove invaluable to teens who may be struggling with their own identities and paths in life. One day can make a lasting difference. Gay it forward with the Homecoming Project. Find us at liveoutloud.info to learn how you can get involved today. This an excerpt from The God Virus by Daryl W. Ray. Every day, religion affects us in ways we may not realize. It makes your Uncle Ned spend hours praying for you. It gives your Baptist neighbor a reason to reject her own child who married a Catholic. 
It teaches your Pentecostal sister to spank her children to keep them from going to hell. It requires a Catholic priest to deny his sex drive. It causes people to give enormous amounts of money to religious organizations and causes you to avoid talking to your cousin Jenny for fear she may try to convert you to Jehovah's Witnesses. Religion has both obvious and subtle influences on you and on society. This book explores the impact of religion on you and your world. It draws open the curtain of mystery and offers ways to understand and make informed decisions about religion. Have you ever wondered what makes religion so powerful? What makes people profess deep faith even as they act in ways that betray that faith? What makes people blind to the irrationalities of their own religion yet see clearly the problems of other religions? How does it weave its way into our political system? If these and similar questions interest you, this book will help you understand its power in you, your family, and your culture. The God Virus by Daryl W. Ray is available at AtheistAudiobooks.com Welcome back to the show. This week's Be a Better Ally segment is about education. And this segment was actually suggested by a friend of the show, Trav Mamone, who listeners of the show will remember I interviewed them about being genderqueer. And Trav sent me an email, and basically we talked about how a lot of times because trans people, gay people, even black people, um, anyone who's part of a minority group that's traditionally, you know, marginalized um, or kind of set apart from society, how a lot of times there's this expectation of us being ambassadors for our group and how, you know, people sort of obligate you, wow, you're the first trans person I've ever met. You have to tell me everything you know about being trans. And... I, I sort of have conflicting feelings on this. Like I have conflicting feelings about a lot of things. Um, me personally, I've chosen to make my life about that in many, many ways. Doing this podcast, the, you know, I'm trying to get invited to conferences to speak and to give presentations. And I do a lot of volunteering in my local community. And I, I, I want, I want to have these conversations and I want to make the world better for trans people and for gay people and for, you know, anyone who's part of the, the queer or trans spectrum, um, and atheists for that matter. But there are also times where I just want to watch Dr. Who and eat ice cream. And if I'm in a gathering of people, like I just want to hang out and have fun with my friends. I don't necessarily feel like I don't necessarily feel like I, I should have to be in activist mode all the time and you know bringing it back to the 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 subject of the show my thought is you know automatically people want caitlin jenner to be an ambassador and to be an educator and be an advocate and i just remember the times that i've been put in that situation where i felt like i have to be that because if i'm the only trans person this person ever meets what's their impression of trans people going to be and i think that's unfair it's reality unfortunately, but it's unfair. So, um, just want to kind of basically say Google exists and go there. And if you want to have these conversations with people, have conversations with people who have made it explicit that, th- that this is a sort of thing that they're into and that they want to do. And maybe ask permission to ask questions. Say, hey, this is something I was wondering about. Is this a conversation you're cool having? Um, to just, to just sort of, you know, basically be, be a better ally to anyone who is in that position. Daniel, thoughts? Yeah, this is an interesting thing. Um, because I, I do have a few people in my life who, who I really care about. And, um, from time to time, they'll ask me, you know, what do you think of this? And what do you think of this? And like you were saying, most of the time, I, I'm, I'm, I welcome those questions and, and it's fine. Um, I, I have also had friends that sort of treat me as the, quote, gay friend of the group. 
And that's when it doesn't feel good because um, I, hi everyone. This is Daniel. He's gay. Yeah, this is my <laughs> this is my gay. I'm not. No, I'm not your gay. This is my gay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know me. No. Oh um, my god. <laughs> yeah, and and just talk and just sort of speak in reference to me. Um, everything that they say, like if it's if they if they're saying something to me or about me, it has to be related to to me being gay and. Um, I, that's where I that's where I start having a problem because I I just want to be Daniel, you know. Uh I want to answer questions and um and may and clarify things when I can when it comes to someone really wanting to know and being curious about gay culture and um and having questions about that. That's usually fine for me. Um but yeah, there's a distinction for me. Yeah, I and and I want to make it clear to the people listening to this show, because people reach out to me regularly and ask me questions and say, you know, what do you think about this? And I am 100% cool with that because like I said, this is largely what I've chosen to make my life about. These are conversations that I want to have and I want people to approach me and ask me questions and, and I, and I want to do that. So I'm not necessarily speaking for myself in all situations here. Um, because, because I mean, it's, it's what I do, but you know, just speaking more generally about, like I said earlier, not everyone wants to be an activist. Not everyone wants to to answer questions about about themselves, especially when it comes to who you have sex with or what your genital arrangement is like or, you know, whether you're taking hormones or any of that or any of that kind of stuff. You know, the, for some people, I mean, I've <laughs> I have no secrets left <laughs> basically. But there are some people who want to be more private about those things, and that's okay. And I think that we need to make sure that we respect that. Yeah, and when you're coming, you know, talking, speaking, not f- for myself, but for for people in general, if you're trying to create a safe space for for these folks, um, if that's something you care about doing, I think that there's a big difference between asking a question that you could easily Google and asking them about a piece of their story because there are a lot plenty of questions that you should probably absolutely just look up on Google right now if they're burning in your mind um, for me I mean even with you Kelly you know sometimes we'll talk about things I'm more interested in some of the details of your personal story and your journey um, than I am about things that I could just easily ask a question on Google and get a, right. get an answer because they apply across the board. So if you know if that's where if that's where you are, um, there are, there are lots of articles, there are tons of resources. If you're interested in be being a, uh, a, a trans ally or or a gay ally, there are, there are lots of resources for you to look up online and and f- kind of figure out what it is to be trans, what it means to be gay, and Maybe focus the the line of questioning to um, maybe focus the line of questioning in a way that shows that you're you care about the, them as a person, not just as a as a subculture. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right, right. It, it, it's it's not not making people into that token trans person or that token gay person. Um, yes, exactly. And, and you know, I'm happy to say that's not an experience that I've had very often. Um, you know, either in, you know, the atheist community, when I'm hanging out with people, when I'm talking to people, um, you know, if it comes up, we talk about it, but it's, you know, people aren't like, unless people are asking me to be on their podcast or something like that, people aren't knocking down my door. Tell me everything about what it means to be trans, you know, like, <laughs> Start at the you know, like most of the time, like these are people who just want to be friends and want to talk and have conversations and have relationships. And that's what I'm all about. Um, and then, you know, obviously we do things like this show and, um, you know, post on Facebook and write and on Tumblr every great once in a while about, you know, the, the things that, that we go through. But I, I think basically the message is don't tokenize people and let's be very careful to not expect a person just because their situation is curious to you to expect them or obligate them to be your teacher. Yeah. And a lot of this too, I think is common sense. If, if you ask, think about the question you're going to ask someone and just quickly, you know, ask yourself, how would I feel about someone asking me a question similar to this? Yes. If if it's something I've had people, you know, I've had guys at parties that I didn't know, um, the guys I didn't know at parties ask me, well, you're, are you attracted to me? 
You know, just like just like it's a curiosity. <laughs> because you're gay, you're attracted to every guy ever. Right. God. And I'm thinking, would you would you want a random person to just walk up to you and ask you that question? Do like, you think I'm hot? Yeah. <laughs> like how creepy would that be? <laughs> it's it's quite creepy because I found like um most of the times when that question's been asked of me, the answer was no, I don't find you I don't find you hot. <laughs> <laughs> right, but you now can't you made me say it. I wasn't going to say it before. <laughs> you can't win in that situation. <laughs> you can't win, and you know if it's a question, that, you know this is something I don't have experience with, but that I've I've listened to my trans friends talking about it. If you have a question that has to do with you know, well, what's going on downstairs? No, don't ask that. Yeah, I mean, unless you're hot and are going to offer to have sex with me. Yeah, you know, if, like if, if sex, <laughs> if a sexual situation like is eminent, that's probably a fair question. Um, but yeah, just use common sense. And um, if, if it's something that you think you would be uncomfortable someone asking you, most people uh, don't want someone coming up to them and just saying, hey, by the way, like, tell me about your penis. Um, or, or, hey, uh, you know, do you think I'm hot? <laughs> right. Nice boobs. Are those real? Yeah, exactly. Um, just, just, just think about it. it. Really, a lot of it really is common sense. I mean, we're pointing it out because, you know, we want to, we want to help uh, kind of clarify how, you, how things you can do actively to be a great ally. But um, common sense is a huge part of it. I couldn't agree more. And that, my friends, is going to do it for this episode of the Gatheus Manifesto on Secular Media Network. I want to say thank you to my co-host, Daniel. My pleasure. And you can find the show on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Gatheist Manifesto. You can email us at the Gatheist Manifesto at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter at Gatheist Cali. And I'm on Twitter at Daniel Wolfsong. And you can find the show on Twitter at The Gatheists. If you want to support The Gatheist Manifesto, the best way to do that, go to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. That sort of thing really does matter in the podcast world, and it will help us get more listeners. We appreciate it. Before we go, I want you to know that if you're lost, you're hurting, you're scared, if you feel like no one cares and no one understands, you need to know there's a community out here that loves you, cares for you, and knows that you're capable of amazing things and that you are worthy of love. If you're struggling, please don't be afraid to reach out. Until next time, my friends, this is The Gatheist Manifesto. <laughs>